Academy of Sublime Masters of the Luminous Ring, founded in France, in 1780, by Baron Blair Finney, one of the Grand Officers of the Philosophy Scotch Rite. The Academy of the Luminous Ring was dedicated to the philosophy of Pythagoras, and was divided into three degrees. The first and second were principally occupied with the history of Freemasonry, and the last with the dogmas of the Pythagorean school, and their application to the highest grades of science. The historical hypothesis, which was sought to be developed in this academy was that Pythagoras was the founder of Freemasonry, Euclid in the year of the world, 3650, and Omundi, which was 646 years after the building of King Solomon's temple, Euclid, the celebrated geometrician, was born. His name has been always associated with the history of Freemasonry, and in the reign of Ptolemy Soter, the order is said to have greatly flourished in Egypt, under his auspices. Euclid, legend of all the old manuscript constitutions contain the well-known legend of Euclid, whose name is presented to us as the worthy clerk Euclid in every conceivable variety of corrupted form. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry by Albert Gallatin Mackey Having thus established what was the meaning and import of the Eleusinian or Dionysian mysteries amongst the ancient Greeks, who transmitted to us the knowledge of them, and having shown that the ceremonies were not intended in their origin, as a worship of the sun, considered as a deity, we shall proceed to examine how those mysteries were communicated to other nations by the Greeks. About fifty years, before the building of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, a colony of Grecians, chiefly Ionians, complaining of the narrow limits of their country, and an increased population, emigrated, and having been settled in Asia Minor, gave to that country the name of Ionia. No doubt that people carried with them their manners, sciences, and religion, and the mysteries of Eleusis among the rest. Accordingly we find that one of their cities, Blos, was famed for the worship of Apollo, as Apollonia had been with their ancestors. These Ionians, participating in the improved state of civilization in which their mother country, Greece, then was, cultivated the sciences, and useful arts, but made themselves most conspicuous in our architecture, and invented or improved the order called by their own name Ionian. These Ionians formed a society, whose purpose was to employ themselves in erecting buildings. The General Assembly of the Society, was first held at Theos, but afterwards, in consequence of some civil commotions, passed to Lodos. This act or society was now called the Dionysian Artificers, as Bacchus was supposed to be the inventor of building theatres, and they performed the Dionysian festivities. They afterwards extended themselves to Syria, Persia, and India. From this period, the science of astronomy which had given rise to the symbols of the Dionysian rites, became connected with types taken from the art of building. These Ionian societies divided themselves into different sections, or minor assemblies. Some of those small or dependent associations, had also their distinguishing names. But they extended their moral views, in conjunction with the art of building, to many useful purposes, and to the practice of acts of benevolence. We find recorded, that these societies, and their utility, were many years afterwards inquired into, by Cambyses, king of Persia, who approved of them, and gave to them great marks of favor. It is essential to observe, that these societies, had significant words to distinguish their members, and for the same purpose they used emblems taken from the art of building. Let us now notice the passage of the Dionysian artificers to Judea. Solomon obtained from Hiram, king of Tyre, men skillful in the art of building, when the temple was erected at Jerusalem. Amongst the foreigners, who came on this occasion, we find men from Gabal, called Jublam, that is to say, the Ionians settled in Asia Minor, for Gabal, or Blows, was that city where stood the Temple of Apollo, where the Eleusinian rites or Dionysian mysteries were celebrated, as we have already stated. We could, in addition to this argument produce some authority, for Josephus says that the Grecian style of architecture was used at the Temple of Jerusalem. After this we cannot be surprised to find that the ceremonies of Eleusis, or Tamas, should be introduced into Judea, particularly, as Solomon himself, after having entered into the scientific allusions, in the construction of the temple, was not free from the accusation of the gross superstition of idolatry. 
So we find some years afterwards the prophet Ezekiel complaining that the Israelitish women were weeping for Tammuz at a certain period of the year, at the very gates of the temple. But it is natural to suppose that the Dionysian artificers would not have attempted to introduce those rites amongst the religious Jews, as a mere matter of idolatry, for the worship of the sun. The ideas of the Israelites, concerning the unity of God, would have revolted at anything, inducing a belief of the polytheism of the Gentiles. The symbol, therefore, in these mysteries, must have been explained to the Jews, to mean only the sun, in the true and original sense of those mysteries, that is to say, as an emblem of God's goodness to man, and the apparent motions of that luminary, first as the guide for fixing the seasons, next as types or remembrances of the immortality of the soul. For this dogma does not appear either clear in the books of the Jews before that period, or universally admitted amongst them. At a much later date. To avoid, therefore, any allusion to idolatry in these ceremonies and symbols, another personage or another name must have been substituted for Adonis or Osiris, and as a symbolical death and resurrection was essential, in the allegory of the system, the history of the death of another individual must have been substituted. However, in framing this new symbolical history, such circumstances were to be related, connected with the death of that personage, as to typify and account for the whole of the Eleusinian mysteries, or the passage of the sun from the upper to the lower hemisphere, and its return up again. In the formation of this new system, or rather new allegory to the same system, though the name of the hero was changed, the circumstances must have been preserved. As far as consistent with new names the whole fabric of the temple would favor an illusion of this sort. The foundation stone was laid on the second day of the second month, which corresponds upon an average to the 20th of April, reckoning the sacred year, upon the fixed zodiac. Now if you rectify your globe to the latitude of Jerusalem 30 degrees, 30 minutes at that period of the year, you will have the sun in Aries, or the sun represented by a ram or sheep, or a man in a sheep's skin, as the Hierophant was represented, in the mysteries of Eleusis. Therefore, the very period of the year, in which the foundation stone of the temple was laid, would afford an opportunity of establishing upon it a new allegorical system, to explain the ancient mystery. If we suppose the globe to represent the world in the position above described, the aspirant being in the west facing the Hierophant, who in the east represents, the rising sun, the candidate will find himself between the two tropics, represented by the two columns which were placed on the west entrance of that temple. The better to understand the facility, with which the ancient system could be adapted to the circumstances of the Temple of Jerusalem, we must consider its typic emblems, according to the notions of the Jews, and some of the Christian fathers. The temples built in honor of the several gods, were so shaped, as to have allusion to the supposed attributes of such gods. But the universe was supposed by the Platonists, to be the true temple of the true and only God. The temple, therefore, dedicated to the true God, was to be a type of the universe. Thus we find that the temple of Jerusalem was situated east and west, and with dimensions and types all adapted to represent the universal system of nature. If the temple of Solomon was a type of the universe, to symbolize that Jehovah was no local God, but the only God, Lord of the universe. Tradition also tells us that the place of assembly of the Dionysian artificers was allegorically described by its dimensions, as a symbol of the universe, in length, in breadth, in height, and in depth. The ancients represented the course of the stars, by the winding of a snake, but if the snake was so placed, as to have the tail in her mouth, it then represented eternity. Now if we consider the beginning of the civil year amongst the Hebrews, the month Tisri, which was in the winter equinox, the sun, proceeding from thence, approaches the south, and touches the tropic of Capricorn, then retrocedes towards the north, crossing the equinoxal, and touching the tropic of Cancer, from whence retroceding again to the south, arrives at the equinoxial, finishing the year. These points, in an extended map of the two hemispheres seem separate, but the emblem of the snake biting its tail, would represent the end of the year, beating the beginning. Mr. Hutchinson has proved, that the globes, on the top of the two columns, at the portico of the temple, were ores, or mechanical representations of the motions of the heavenly bodies. 
Sketch for the History of the Dionysian Artificers A Fragment by Hippolyto Joseph da Costa, ESQ. London sold by Mr. Sherwood, Neely, and Jones, Paternoster Row 1820. Regional rivalry drove many Gothic builders to ever more dangerous heights. But why? Some experts suspect they were motivated by something beyond earthly bragging rights. For hidden within the dimensions of the greatest cathedrals may be a secret mathematical code that could provide the answer. At Notre Dame of Paris, perhaps the best known Gothic cathedral, Stéphane van Lieferange, a physicist turned art historian, uses a laser scanner to investigate. He measures the height of the church's two levels. Each measures 32.8 feet. But medieval builders used a different unit of measurement. If you translate it in royal feet, which is the medieval unit, then that would be about 30 royal feet for the lower level and 30 royal feet for the higher level. The combined height is 60 royal feet. These figures, 30 and 60, are strangely familiar to Van Lieferinge. At one of France's oldest libraries, the Bibliothèque Mazarin, he searches a medieval book written by the priest in charge of building Notre Dame. What we have here is a manuscript from the turn of the 12th century, which was composed by the Chancellor of Notre Dame, Peter Comester. Called the Historia Scholastica, the priest wrote this book during the cathedral's construction. He fixates on a passage in the Old Testament, a detailed description of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, which the Bible refers to as God's house on earth. Here, Van Lieferinge finds an intriguing clue. In altitudine triginta cubitos habebat, usque ad primum tabulatum, this manuscript reveals that to the builders of Notre Dame, the dimensions of Solomon's temple were profoundly important. 30 cubits to the first level and 60 cubits to the second level. These numbers are built into Notre Dame. So an interesting correspondence here, a very intriguing correspondence here. Are these numbers purely coincidence? Or did medieval builders intentionally encode sacred numbers from the Bible into their cathedrals? Just southwest of Paris, clues are embedded in the crown jewel of Gothic architecture, Chartres Cathedral. The stained glass here, most of it 800 years old, is world famous. But Chartres has Bible stories etched not only in light, but also in stone. These intricate exterior statues are staples of Gothic cathedrals, finishing flourishes that took dozens of carvers decades to complete. But at Chartres, alongside statues of Jesus, Mary, and the apostles, Gothic expert Jacqueline Jung investigates something completely unexpected. Greek and Roman scientists who predate Christianity by hundreds of years. Among them, Aristotle, Euclid, and Pythagoras, the great mathematician. These ancient pagans were revered by medieval priests at Chartres. The Cathedral of Chartres was filled with some of the leading thinkers of this time who were themselves steeped in classical philosophy, science, and literature, and were bringing these ideas to Christian theology in ways that were really quite new. While the cathedral was being built, priests at Chartres studied classical Greek and Roman ideas. Medieval priests seized on the idea that the supreme beauty of the universe is based on perfect proportions and ideal numbers. They saw God as the supreme mathematician 
a divine geometer who used sacred dimensions. People were interested in using numbers as a means of figuring out the proportions uh, by which God himself had created the universe. Medieval priests found numbers in the Bible that they believed were God's sacred dimensions. If they used those numbers in cathedral building, can experts find them today? On the hunt for divine dimensions, Stephen Murray returns to Amiens, where builders rescued the cathedral with an iron chain. He starts by measuring the area at the very center of the cross, where the four central columns form a square. The geometric code that gives the shape of this building involves a great square that sits right here in the middle. Each side of the central square measures almost exactly 50 Roman feet, the unit of measure used by the builders at Amiens. 50 also happens to be an important number from the Bible. God tells Noah to build an ark that is 50 cubits wide to save him from the flood. Noah's ark was 50 cubits. This is 50 feet, and this lies at the heart of the building. Like at Notre Dame, it looks as if engineers at Amiens encoded a measurement from the Bible into their cathedral. So let's do that. Murray and Talon turn to the laser scan models. There we are. Now we're using a perspective view as opposed to an orthogonal one. Using that, this that, technology, yeah. for the first time, they can measure the height of the cathedral down to the nearest millimeter. Let's see if we can choose one of the keystones and drop a line down to the floor. We'll get the distance down to the pavement below. We get 42.55 meters. Some quick math converts modern units to medieval units. A Roman foot is what we think they used. And produces another divine figure, 144. A carnal sense. As In the New Testament, heaven is called the city of God. Its height, 144. This is the book of Revelation, the vision of St. John the Divine. As John measures the city, he finds it's 144 cubits. Amazingly, at the dedication ceremony for the opening of Amiens Cathedral, the bishop read aloud the very same passage from the book of Revelation that describes the divine height, 144. So we're dealing in the building with clearly a number that express some kind of object of desire. They wanted 144. Their search for divine dimensions continues at Beauvais, the cathedral that partly collapsed. So we're going to take a point here and down on the floor below. They measure the height. Check the measurement, and it is 144.3. The same number at Beauvais. They're aiming at this celestial number. The builders at both Amiens and Beauvais used the height of God's heavenly city in the Bible to design the height of their cathedrals. Along with the discovery of Solomon's temple encoded at Notre Dame and Noah's Ark at Amiens, experts have uncovered compelling evidence that some medieval architects used measurements from the Bible as a blueprint for building their cathedrals. Using sacred numbers, Gothic engineers strived to make cathedrals a kind of heaven on earth, a sacred place for transporting medieval minds from their daily lives of toil to the lofty heights of eternity. Even the floor plan of the cathedral is the ultimate Christian symbol of salvation, the crucifix. The building is a vehicle, it takes you somewhere else. A cathedral, in a sense, is a medium, it's a transport, it takes us to heaven.